Now, let me tell you something. You and I, we get stalled in our believing lives. Anybody just like stalled? Not a bad place. Um, not a sinful place necessarily. Uh, just We just get to a place and we kind of just like stop here. Everything starts looking the same. Could somebody raise their hand that says, yeah, I'm kind of in that place. Kind of want to go somewhere new. Because if you're feeling that way, it's, you're in exactly the right place. If you're not feeling that way, sit here for a minute and I hope you will. Because we're going somewhere new. Everybody say, we're going somewhere new. And say, I'm going to be somebody new. Okay, so when I get a keyword, when the Lord gives me a concept that is a word, and I mean, he dropped this word in my heart a couple of weeks ago and then began to associate it in prayer. When I get a word like that that just drops in my spirit, then I wait to see what city is going to be connected with it, what living proof life, what message is it supposed to go with. So very soon after that, it came to me, Stockton, California. I began to um, see it put together. So what I will do every time it's a word like that out of the Scriptures, I'll run it on, um, in a concordance to see every single place it appears in Scripture. So I looked at every single time the word advance or advanced pops up in Scripture, and I looked in both the NIV and the ESV. So one of the contexts, of course, sometimes it comes up, like if you were talking about like an advance payment on something, that's not going to be the same meaning as our word. So sometimes the word comes up in a different context that is not ours. And 10 different times, how many times did I just say? 10 different times in the ESV, the word advanced came up in the context in the phrase advanced in years. Hmm. I'm more interested these days than I used to be. Advanced in years. So listen, listen, I looked up every single one of them. Stay with me here because this was just major to me. I had to stand up to receive this, and then I had to call Melissa and tell her about it, and then I had to prove it to her in the Scriptures in my office. Ten times out of ten times, how many times? Ten times out of ten times in the ESV where I found the phrase advanced in years, every single time there was still something significant that was going to happen in their lives. If not, listen, if not the most significant thing of their lives. Ten out of ten times, they still had a future and something significant coming. Four times out of ten times, it was the reason they were on the planet. Oh, I'm just dying here. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come have my moment right here. I'm going to just give you a couple so that you can understand, but you can look them all up for yourself across the board. Look at every single one. The one in Genesis 18, 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. Um, that you know what happened there if you're familiar with the narrative, that they are, of course, going to give birth to this child that the line, this blessed line of Abraham, this is going to be I. Isaac. So they've got this, this is going to happen for them in a year. They still have many, many years ahead. Joshua 13 verse 1. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years and the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. <laughs> Listen. Listen. When the ancient of days says you were old and advanced in years. I think that it is safe to say, I mean, at least with the Lord, wouldn't we be like children in a sob? But he's like, you are old. <laughs> Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. Thank you, Lord. But look what the rest of it says, and there remains yet very much land to possess. Now listen, listen, I think I can say across the board in this room, I don't care how old and advanced in years you are, the fact that you are still living and breathing tells me that there is more land for you to possess. I, oh, somebody, I need somebody to have revival in this house. Somebody needs to have revival in this house. You have not been counted out. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. 
Here, here's what I want to say to you. Are you advanced in years? Well, then I have one word for you this weekend. Advance. Advance. Advanced in years? Well, advance. And you know what I'm just going to say to you? The more well advanced you are in years, the faster I need you to advance. Amen? <laughs> like, come on now. Come on. This is not something for you to go home and pray about for the next year. <laughs> Look at one another and say, get with it. Yeah. We're going to have to get with this. We got some getting with this. New. Okay, okay, okay. What letter are we on? We have an A. What is A? What is D? What letter are we on? V is this. Vie fiercely in prayer. Vie fiercely in prayer. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you've got it together. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care what all you can do. I don't care what ministry you have. You are not and I am not going to live bolder than we pray. Listen, if you and I are going to advance this weekend, we have got to advance in prayer. Are your prayer lives already where you want them? Anybody? Anybody? I mean, just would anybody go, you know what? No, I think mine's about right. <laughs> listen, listen, you and I are about to have a release in our prayer lives. I have prayed, I want to get somebody's eyes I have prayed for all 5,000 of us to have the biggest awakening in our prayer lives that we have had in our entire lives, in our entire lives. God gave me the word detonate this weekend, that he's going to detonate our prayer lives. It is a word that means to explode. It is a word that means in that um, detonate, that, that, um, those last two syllables come from the Latin denare, and that means to thunder to get a thunder in our prayer lives. Listen, some of us have been having the same kind of quiet time for 25 years, and we need to get some volume in our quiet time. It may be that our, our quiet times are too quiet. Anybody know what I'm saying? We got to buy fiercely in prayer. You have the right, if you are in Christ, you have the right and the resources to be immensely powerful in prayer. L listen to me, girlfriend. Listen, the devil ought to know what time you set your alarm in the morning. Oh, I'm just going to wait for somebody to get that. I'm just going to wait. He ought to know what time you get up because he already knows that once you get up and once you start believing in prayer, once you start claiming where the scripture says you have promises that you get to be assured will take place in your life and will take place on planet earth. Demons ought to know that you're up having your prayer time. Anybody, I'm, you know, and let me tell you something. You know why I didn't wait on this till Saturday morning? Let's just be frank here because I like to just like, let's be realists here. Let's be realists here. Do you know that if we had said this weekend in Stockton, California, that we, instead of having our regular Living Proof Live, we were going to have a conference. We we're going to have a prayer conference. Do you know that we would probably have a fourth of us here? Am I telling the truth? And you know what, that's not, that's not dogging us. It's not saying that we're immature. It's just saying that, you know what, we don't think it's exciting. And listen, 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 God is about to excite our prayer lives. Because listen, there's nothing like being in contact with the one who said, let there be light, and boom, there was light. That's what we're talking about. We're not just talking about, I mean, it's like talking to the air. We are talking about coming in to dialogue with the great and glorious creator of all the universe for whom nothing is impossible, for whom every single promise will never drop to the ground, a word to explode um, in our prayer lives, a word to vibe fiercely in prayer, that once God says where, we go there in prayer. You and I have got to learn that when we make an advance, we've got to make the advance in prayer in the heavenlies before we can make it down here in the ground of earth. Otherwise, if we are not getting prepared and taking it in prayer, we're going to get there on earth if we get there at all, and we're going to be ill-prepared, and we're not going to have the muscle to keep it. It is not only about us taking our land, advancing in that land. It's about having the muscle once we get there to keep it. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? So these things, listen, you and I have got to learn to get fierce in prayer. 
as one of the reasons why we're here tonight. There, there are so many reasons. Listen, listen, it's, it's what the Word of God calls in Matthew 16, 19, loosing it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Makes perfect sense to us because why would God say, listen, I'm just going to let you pray whatever you want. I'm just going to do it. That doesn't even make sense. What he's saying is this. I've loosed things up here, and I'm looking for somebody who wants it. Oh. I'm going to say that again to somebody. I got all this that I've untied up here. I just need somebody to come for it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, here it is. You can let it sit here all year long, or you can come and get it. I've got some things bound up here that are still loosed on earth. They're bound up here. My will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's bound up here. I'm looking for somebody with the guts enough to claim what I have already done and get down there and stop that thing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There is a special beauty in prayer, knowing that it's by God's design, His desire, that we draw near to Him, that we whisper our hopes and dreams, speak our love, disclose our fears, confess our failures. In prayer, we are formed by God, fashioned by the Holy Spirit into the image of Jesus. But the discipline of prayer is also something we must learn. Beth Moore addresses the practical matters of prayer in Whispers of Hope. She walks us through an easy to apply method of prayer coupled with daily devotions and prompts that help us put this prayer method into action. Whispers of Hope teaches that daily Bible reading results in a powerful, word-saturated prayer life. Visit our website today and you can order Whispers of Hope, an especially priced bundle from Lifeway, which includes a lined prayer journal. Both items are available now for the special price of $10, but only for a limited time and only at our website. Hey everybody, it would be my delight to invite you to be part of our 2018 Living Proof Live simulcast. This is a huge date on our calendar and with every bit of faith we can muster, we believe God to come and meet with us that day in all sorts of places. There are churches that will gather and there are small groups that will gather, but the beautiful thing about it is that you can come all by yourself without ever leaving your front door. For crying out loud, you don't even have to leave your bedroom. You can be in your pajamas with your laptop, Bible open. You've got your coffee or your tea. You are ready to go. We would love so much to invite you. Come be part of it. See what God will do. I have attended things exactly like this and felt the power of God fall on me. I've worshiped with all of my heart and with all of my volume unashamed and met with God. Come be part of it. I would love so much to be with you that day. Let me tell you, there are several reasons why we shrink back in prayer. For one thing, we feel stupid. Am I telling the truth? We feel silly. What if it turns out, I'm just saying that this has occurred to everybody in this room at some place in their spiritual life, you've thought to yourself that one reason why you don't just really get in there and do the thing is because what if it turns out that Jesus is your imaginary friend? I mean, you're just holding back a little bit in case this doesn't turn out to be true. Am I telling the truth to anybody? Am I? You know it's the truth. We've been there a thousand times. I'm going to tell you something. Here's, here's some wonderful news that somebody needs to hear. Jesus is not an imaginary friend. We have the historical Jesus. He's not a man. Nobody made him up and put him on the page. Jesus of Nazareth lived. He's accounted for in history. Where we come with our faith, is he the son of God? Can he do absolutely anything? Did he give his life for me? Did, was he raised from the dead? And does he, did he ascend to the right hand of God? And is he coming back to claim his kingdom? You better believe it. You better believe it. That's where our faith comes in. As far as is he imaginary, no girlfriend. He's not. He's not. I'm going to ask you, what would happen? What would happen if we just like, were in prayer we set a chair right here and just went, what if I acted like Jesus was sitting in it? I mean, if he was just like, he said he would, lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the earth, even to the end of the age. What if we prayed like he was sitting right in front of us in all his grandeur? I mean, we'd have to be like putting our shades on. 
try to get over the light, the lightning brilliance of him. I mean, there he is just going, go ahead, don't let me bother you, just go ahead. What, what was it you wanted to say? Now, the reason why we can't do that is because with the way we are prone to idolatry, we'd start worshiping the chair. I praise you, chair. I praise you, chair. I believe in you, chair. I, I, I love you, chair. So as it turns out, we don't get to do that. But what if, what if we did? What if we began to understand that he's in the room with you? He's in the room with you. I mean, when you pray, he is with you. We, uh, another reason is that we get bored. Uh, listen, here's what happened. Here's what's gone around us. We associate closing our eyes and bowing our head with Who wouldn't? So we've got, I mean, who, uh, who does not on occasion on Sunday morning enjoy a long prayer? <laughs> because you can get a little bit of shut eye. Am I telling, I'm sorry, am I telling the truth to anybody? Yes, yes, because we've been there. Okay, here's the other big thing. Your biggest obstacle in your prayer life, in your current prayer life, is your last big unanswered prayer. Would somebody that say that's true? You will know why that thing was delayed someday. You will even know if you got to know, you will understand why someday. But what happens and what the enemy is banking on is that that thing is going to become such an obstacle to you that you cannot go on. Listen, listen. This weekend, we're going to scale the wall. It, listen, it, so what if we go on? It'll still be there. God still knows that thing is there. He still knows that thing worries you and you're thinking, what happened there? I really believed you for that. What happened there? But we're so, listen, we're so upset over this, we won't get to 90 other things that God would just like pour out the heavenlies to do right before our very eyes because we're just stuck right here. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody? I mean, it's like a big one, big one. We're just going to go, well, you know what? I'm still, I'm still worried about that, I'm a, but I'm going to go on. Would you be willing to just advance, go over the wall? Okay, I cannot wait to get to A. This is our second A. Add traction to your action. We're going to get some traction. And what does traction mean? I mean, it means we're like a, we've got enough tread on our shoes to make some advancement. How do we do it? How do we get some, some traction going in our action? One of the things for you and I, when we think about our prayer lives, when we think about an explosion in our prayer lives, start to shake it up. We're going to shake up our prayer lives. Somebody know what I'm talking about? We're going to shake it up. We're going to shake it up. One way we're going to shake it up is start changing up your posture. So I kept saying these words because God gave me these four words over and over, and I've said them over and over to him. Face, knees, seat, feet. Face, knees, seat, feet. Face, knees, seat, feet. Face, knees, seat, feet. Because I found out in the scriptures that those are the four primary postures in prayer. That you find people that are on their face, and then you find people that pray on their what? And then you find people that pray on their And then you're going to find that there are people that pray. What's that? Tell me again. All right, tell me this. Tell me again. Tell me again. Okay, so listen, one of my very first postures in the morning, and again, what I'm trying to shake us out of is routine this weekend. So I'm not saying, don't just go, I'm going to start doing that every morning. Then that defeats the purpose. Because what we're talking about, shake that baby up. We're going to shake this baby up. Well, I'll come in, I push my coffee pot on, and I come to the floor, and I go down just like this. There's, listen, there's just nothing like sometimes going face down. So we got face down here. This is face. So just like, I mean, there are times when something is just so desperate on my heart. I, even when I got to my hotel room last night in Stockton, I went straight to the floor, face down. I need Jesus in the worst way. I got nothing for you if Jesus doesn't come through for me. Nothing. So face down, face down this is important. Then there is, there's, the, there's face down. 
Then there's the knees, praying on our knees. Then there's praying, sitting, and we're calling that seat. And then there's praying in the scriptures that is on the feet. I'm going to just talk through some of these with you because I just think they're the coolest thing. There's all sorts of examples of them. Face down, uh, we see, for instance, when Abraham, when God made a covenant with Abraham, Abraham fell on his face in Genesis chapter 17. In Matthew 26, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus himself went face down in prayer. So we got, what is this one right here? And then what have we got right here? So we got knees. There are several of all sorts of places you'd find this. Second Chronicles 6, 12 through 14, this gorgeous, gorgeous portion when King Solomon kneels when he asks God to bless the temple and the people of God. Um, Psalm 95, verse 6, oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Uh, Jesus also in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke's gospel, he knelt down on his knees before the Lord. I learned that um, in the Council of Nicaea that was in the year uh, 325 A.D., that literally they would forbid, don't start doing this, I just think this is interesting, but they forbade people apt on Resurrection Sunday till the day of Pentecost to be down on their knees in prayer in church. I mean, they could do it at home, but in church, they did not kneel, and kneeling was huge in church in those days. So from Resurrection Sunday to Pentecost, um, to the day of Pentecost, they did not kneel. Why? Because kneeling was primarily in the early church penitential. In other words, we would come on our knees and we would confess sin, which is what many of us have done many, many times, make confession of sin. Well, they're, they're feeling, this was so powerful to me, was that because Jesus had risen, that we also rise with him. That he literally, because of what he did on the cross of Christ, we do not have to be just laid out in our wails and confessions. We can be, we can be, but you know what we get to do because of the power of the cross and the resurrection? Girlfriend, get up. Oh, I'm gonna have revival all by myself. I mean, is that beautiful? Is that just beautiful? So they stood because it was resurrection day on that good Friday down here, down here, down here. But on resurrection Sunday, up on your feet, up on your feet. Jesus Christ has risen again and we will rise with him. Hallelujah. Oh, okay. Now, in all the postures of praying, this was the fewest one. And it is the one overwhelmingly in this room we do. And it's one reason we are half asleep. Is that fair to say? In the scriptures, sitting is associated with authority. The 24 elders are seated around the throne in Revelation chapter 4. Ephesians 2 verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Listen to me. You're going to sit your hind end down to pray. Take some authority. It is the position of authority. Oh, I've just about had it. Okay. Okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Where are we? Okay. What are we? One more. Okay, right here with feet, over and over and over again. This one is the big one. I mean, it it exceeds in number. So many of the rest of them being on the feet. I'm just going to throw you out a few. Malachi 2.5, God said, he revered me and he stood in awe of my name. In Nehemiah, where they're um, coming together and worshiping and hearing the word, it says that, that the choirs literally stood up and Nehemiah himself stood up and gave thanks to God in the house of the Lord. In Luke 18, in verses 10 through 13, Both the proud Pharisee and the humble tax collector both stood to pray over and over again. And listen to me, all sorts of different ways they did it. Jesus prayed with his eyes wide open looking straight up. I mean, 
Listen, there's a beautiful part to bowing our heads and closing our eyes. That's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. As long as we're wide awake doing it. You know what I'm saying to you? But listen, if you're not, what it's mainly for is not getting distracted. So if you can stay undistracted and keep those eyes open and go, Jesus, I believe you for today. I believe you over my family. I believe your word. I take you at your word today. In fact, you know what I'm going to do, Lord? I'm going to read you your own word because I know you're going to be delighted when I tell you what all you have promised your people. This is going to be your delight. You understand what I'm talking about? Get up on your feet. Walk the thing out. Scare the dogs under the bed. Because we're going to get some quiet out of our time. I have come here to invite you on a quest. Now, I did not say a journey. I said a quest. And we're going to find out in this session that there is a big difference between a trip and a quest. A quest always, always demands something daring out of us. Living Proof would like to send you a thank you gift for your donation. Visit Bethmore.org forward slash donate.